Right guys, Jack here, JBF Music and Guitar Lessons. What I'm doing in this video is uh, breaking down Bandmade's live performance of Don't You Tell Me, but just looking exclusively at the solo section. You've got to see my first kind of time listening to the song and reaction to that. You can get it with the eye, which I think will be up there. Um, and also the kind of analysis I did to the rest of the song. This, I'm just going to focus on the solo trading bit because you guys seem quite up for that and I'm quite happy to revisit it as well. So I think I've got the video roughly lined up to where the solos are. So I'm going to go through it bit by bit and see what we can uh, see what we can break down. Okay, so the way they've entered into the solo um, it's a great dynamic drop down and you guys also, I, I didn't notice on the first or the subsequent <laughs> listens through uh, but the toms, uh, stuff going on with the drums as well which just adds an extra kind of level of dynamics to it. But here it's cool, you've got a guitar ringing out, is it D? I think I remember that from last time because the song started with a kind of D ringing out. So you got the rhythm guitar just letting that ring out the drums have hit a cymbal, maybe the kick drum there, oh, let's just double check it Yeah kick drum I think and a cymbal so you get this kind of low thump, with that nice psh, kind of splash over the top and yeah she's sliding into D which is the chord that's underneath it so that all makes musical sense I guess cleaner slide and I think here she was just kind of going up a scale it might even be the D up here something along those lines let's find out So you could kind of call this doing din 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 din. You could call it almost like a sequence. So sequence is basically just like a musical idea that you take through a scale. And she's going up in groups of four. So if you know your kind of scales and you know what key it's in, this is like a great shortcut to working things out. Something like that. Double check it. Do do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the reason it might sound a bit classical to you is she uses a scale that's called the harmonic minor and I apologize for throwing all these music terminologies out at you but the harmonic minor um, it, it just sounds more classical, it's used in classical music more so you see that final note, the second, penultimate note, the second last one before it goes up to there that's why it's got the slight uh, neoclassical thing. And also in classical music, it's quite common to use things like sequences and going up a scale in thirds. So you know you can hear a kind of pattern that's like... You call that going up in thirds because you're going up, you're missing the second note, going to the third note, going back to that note that you've missed out and then going up a third from there, right? So if you've ever wondered why that sounds classical, because she's using a sequence, which is like a melodic idea, kind of going up through the scale, and kind of coming back down it. The scale she's using is very kind of associated, like like Ingvy Malmsteen, he kind of popularized that scale for hard rock and that sort of thing, okay? So it's more of the kind of same thing, that kind of doom 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 doom. Where are we? D. And she was doing that, right? And then a big slide up the fretboard there as well, nice. Something else I noticed here, um, as well as the toms, there's an incredibly quiet synth coming in the background here, uh, just on the left hand side. If you listen really closely, it's like it's some sort of D chord, I'd assume it's doing a D minor really really quiet in there and I did not pick on that first time at all so that makes me think um, this might be a bit more structured out than I'd thought because I, I assumed it was kind of an improvised solo but I think it might be more written out or more planned because if there's a card kind of sequence going on it means that the click track is still very much on which means there's a set amount of time that they'll do things for and if there's a set amount of time they might want to do things in a certain way so they don't accidentally you know take up an uh, 8-bar solo instead of a 4-1 or that sort of thing. Like, um, a lot of time when you're doing a song, if you don't have a click track, you can have an idea of the structure, but you might have like a, a kind of half jam section where there's a loose idea of like, 
you'll do this bit and then this bit and then this bit and depending on how responsive or unresponsive your crowd is you can either extend certain things or kind of cut them short so you don't really get that um kind of luxury or uh, additional crowd interaction type stuff with a click track but you do get a very kind of regimented idea of what's happening all the time and it means you can do things like have the synth come in without having to have a guy stand backstage and just you know play one card every few songs or something like that. And that fast lick, that doodly 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 thing, I think I'd broken that down in the last video, which again, I'll link to that or the playlist with the eye, it's up there. It's just a little chromatic thing. So here she's kind of signaling that she'd be going away from the kind of slightly more classical feeling. Okay. Even those lines before, doo -doo 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 -doo, you can imagine that being done by an orchestra, yeah? Cool. Where are we? So what's going on there? Okay, that's pretty cool. So she bent up to a very consonant note, a note that's in the chord. This is probably over a D minor, right? Which is a, a D, an F, and an A. So she bent up to an A, but then dropped it down to a G. So that's where you get this like slight floaty feeling from. That G note isn't in a, a D minor chord. If you put it in, you get like a, a sus4. So I'm trying not to get too heavy with the music theory, but I'll play that chord for you so you can kind of hear how, how, how it feels, how it sounds. So you've just got a, a D, for example, D minor. If you wanted to add in a G, where's the best place I can add one? I'll add one in on top, so I'll put it, can I stretch that? Okay, I'll put it here. So you see that note on top? Just add in just a bit more kind of flavour to it. And it's something they really love to do, is these kind of nice, not quite jazzy, but kind of almost like post-rock chord extensions. And then we've got Misa coming in here with a, just a nice thunk on the bass string, which I'm presuming she's dropped down to D. Um, and it's just like, you know, it's a great way to start the solo. Boom, it's bass time, right? I make a mistake, it was doon doom. doon. So does she come in ahead of the beat? Let's find out. Now on the beat. Boom, boom, boom. So that would be going from flat seventh up to the root and then down to the root. You know what? I'm going to grab my bass. <laughs> and hopefully break some of this down too, right? And before I forget to say, if you like what I'm doing here, you have any suggestions, and feel free to hit me up on patreon.com forward slash jbfmusic. If you don't feel like doing that, just leaving a like and a comment in general is just fantastic for the channel. And once again, thanks for all the support you guys have given. But yeah, let's get back to it. Cool, yeah. So it's this, instead of just hitting the low string like I thought she had, she's doing this nice little hammer on and then hitting it. And I think she's done a muted note, so like... By muted note, I mean she's not actually playing a note. I, I, I might be mishearing this, so it might not be there, but it sounds like she's doing this kind of hammer on then, just hitting a muted note. So not letting anything, any notes ring out here, but still hitting the string. So you get like a percussive sound. And it's a great way of saying like what key you're in, just hitting that low note and thunking on it, okay? So a mild complaint I would have here is I think the drum fill does actually overpower the bass a tiny bit here. She could have maybe taken the dynamics down or just chilled out a little bit because I'm going to have to like listen to that a wee bit to pick up on exactly what was going on, which I didn't have to do with the guitar solo because it's not competing for like um, you know, audio real estate in the same way. It's in a different kind of frequency set. Okay, she's kind of sliding up. Boom, doom, doom. Something along those lines. So kind of more pentatonic based, which is what you'd expect from a bass solo because it's just a very forgiving scale. It just sounds kind of cool, right? Cool. And there, we've kind of just gone up higher so you can hear what she's doing more. And you will have heard that probably quite horrendous sounding squeal from the right hand side here so what has happened there 
is that I think uh, Konami's maybe turned her guitar on a little bit too soon. So what she's probably done, uh, this is a huge part of playing live as well, is she's either rolled her volume down, so if she hits her guitar by mistake or whatever, it's not going to make a noise, stood on a pedal like a tuner, which often have a built-in mute, so it means you're getting no signal sent to the amplifier, and it means you're not going to make noise when you don't want to. So she's either rolled up her volume or stepped on the pedal a little bit ahead of her solo. Uh, the reason for doing this is you don't want to miss the first beat of your solo because then you're, no sound comes through the amp and you're throwing yourself off right at the start. So you are better to err on the side of caution, but that's what that blast of feedback probably was, right? Right. Okay, um, I don't know whether I'm going to break down all these licks. If there are ones in particular you'd like me to demonstrate, then hit me up in the comments. But I'm just going to talk about generally what she's doing here. I thought the solo was going to end sooner, and I was looking to see if she was using her, her volume pot to adjust the uh, cut off her guitar knot, right? But it goes on for longer than I thought it did, so we'll check that. We'll check that again. So he's using these big slides, almost kind of Steve Vai style uh, slides, where you basically just take a note, hit it, and then slide to a different one. So you get this nice kind of smooth lean, 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 lean type of sound. And she, she, if I've noticed something about her playing is that she does use a lot of slides. So I'm wondering if she's kind of making them a bit of a, a trademarky thing to kind of uh, use in her solos. And then here. Yeah, so if she kind of finishes the slide selection, what she's doing here is trilling. So you basically hold down one note and hit a higher note, go between those in quick succession. She's combining that with the sliding, so it's not totally abandoned as a concept and taking it up the neck. This is uh, something Dave Murray from Iron Maiden does a lot and really excels at. I've covered loads of stuff to do with Dave Murray's trilling, which you can get with the eye if you play guitar and you're interested in this kind of, this kind of sound of soloing. It sounds pretty cool and is relatively easy to do, particularly if you're trilling on, on one string in terms of like flash or kind of fast sounding guitar techniques, okay? What is also really cool is with the, the stage lighting here, they're doing spotlights and I hadn't picked up on that before and that's incredibly powerful because it's showing you where to look as the audience because uh, we are incredibly visual creatures. Brilliant. Sadly, it means I don't get to see if she's rolling her volume pot down or standing on a pedal, but um, I suspect it's probably volume pot because I don't think she was that close to her pedal board there. Anyway, back to the bass here. So a very similar start, I kind of doom doom. Is it that same? So I think she's doing the same kind of flat seven to root move. The root is basically a fancy word of saying the main uh, main note of the chord. So she's going up to a D. Cool, and a little bass bend. Uh, you don't see bends on a bass much because the strings are much thicker. You can probably even see from this far away that like even the thinnest string is probably thicker than the thickest string I have on my guitar. So because the strings are thicker, there's more tension and bending isn't the, isn't the easiest thing to do. So you'll just get these kind of bluesy bends like she does here. So that is quite an unusual bend. It sounds cool, but um, in an ideal world, you'd probably want to bend that up, up by a tone and back down. She's doing more of a quarter tone, so it's not really moving from uh, the target pitch, a quarter tone is a fancy way of saying a note in between a note. So here to here is a semitone. So a quarter tone is the notes that exist somewhere in between there and there. So anytime you bend the string a bit sharp, but don't quite get to the next note, you could call it a quarter tone or a microtone. It uses, uh, gets used in blues a lot. So if you don't think that bit sounds a bit bluesy, then that'll be why. And this kind of similar to the classical thing, an idea of going down the scale and again using the higher register of the bass so it's easier to hear. Right, so what she's doing here is a thing called a double stop. So it's playing a note and playing another note with it. And it sounds like a double stop bend. So I think she's 
playing a note and bending up a note to reach that. So that's where you get this kind of uh, tension and kind of dissonance from. So to break down what is happening there, um, just aiming for this note here, this is the, the target note, right? It's an F. So if you remember from before when I talked about a D minor, that is a D, an F, and an A, it makes sense because it's in the chord. And she's also playing this note, which is a a bit of an odd choice. That's the uh, flat second. So it's a semitone above our D. It's not really in the scale. But what she's doing is bending that up by a tone, right? To match the pitch of the note she's holding here. This, this is a fairly kind of common rock thing to do. So instead of playing the notes like this, where it's incredibly dissonant, this lower one gets bent up to pitch to join it. And what this lets you do, instead of having it nice and playing the note or doing uh, octaves, I uh, shout out <laughs> to guys that hear me mention octaves all the time on these videos. Which also sounds a bit too polite, you get a bit of grit. And you can make it very consonant by making the note almost identical or dip it slightly. So you can hear I'm kind of dipping it. More dissonant, consonant. And that's just a, moving the finger a tiny bit. So you can get this nice mix of, it's got a clear note definition, but there's a lot of grit to it as well, okay? And I think she's just taking that up the scale. Okay, just up to the next note in the scale, but exactly the same idea, exactly the same shape, taking this thing and just moving it up. And we're bouncing back to the bass here, so this is where the solos uh, kind of speed up. So as well as the drums keeping things going on, the little uh, synth keyboard in the background, they're taking shorter solo times and it's reflected in the stage moves as well because they've come closer together and rather than doing one spotlight in one and then kind of on the other, they're they're, they're together here. So that is a technique called tremolo picking, uh, where you just kind of sporadically pick. Ah, I missed out one note. And uh, not bad <laughs> plucking out of there. But again, this is the advantage of, of knowing your scales and the key you're in, because I was like, it sounds like she's starting on a D and going up the scale. So you just pick the string as fast as you can. And again, instead of just playing the notes, it adds a bit more excitement. Arguably a bit more dissonant, so it's kind of like the, the double stop idea that you can add a bit more kind of spice to the playing. Yeah, and I think I clocked this when I was watching it through the first time that I thought at this point they're probably going to mirror each other more because that's also what they're doing visually. They're standing in front of each other, so again, it's signaling to us that there's probably going to be a bit more a conversation here happening kind of between them uh, musically, musical conversation. Uh, trend picking on bass arguably a tiny bit harder because the strings are thicker so you do need to put a bit more into it it's, it's the same idea just getting the pick going fast through the strings if you play guitar and want to break down off trend picking i've done a lesson before which you can get with i up there and here she went for some kind of double stop stuff again so this is all kind of like your rock staples when you're learning your your rock guitar licks that's kind of stuff that you do is a double stop again it's a fancy way of saying playing two notes at the same time playing that note and that note right and again it just adds a bit of raunch if you just played one of the notes or the higher one it doesn't sound quite as cool and i kind of you'll often put a tiny quarter tone bend if you remember what that is on that double stop so rather than it being consonant you get a little bit more dissonance Again, it's the thing that's been taken from the blues, these kind of quarter tone bends. So it sounded like she ended on a... It's just another kind of common double stop. If I have enough cards left, I will link to a lesson on double stops um, up there. But it's a similar idea, you're playing two notes that are 
different strings and bend in one of them. That one's used in country quite a lot, you'd hear it in Slash's playing an awful lot, that one. Cool, and I think this is where they do the, the, the twin duo, uh, what was it, twin power duo brother, that's what Steve Vai liked to call Billy Sheehan, so I think that's what they've got going on here. So again, this is that kind of trend picking thing, just picking the string uh, very quickly, uh, so you get that kind of rapid feeling that more is happening, and I think the drums are doubling up the fact that more is happening as well. Yeah, so it's more of a dum 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 rather than just being a kind of fill for part of the bar, it's kind of cr she's creating more of a steady, reliable beat, a kind of tribal beat, because she's using the toms, that's kind of what they, they have, that's what kind of sound you can get from them. Cool, so uh, Misa's playing something quite similar to what she did before, which is quite a nice callback to what they're doing. And of course, because they're playing in the same key and stuff like that, the parts kind of complement each other quite nicely as well. They're not standing on each other's toes or the basses. In a more bassy register, the guitar is going up quite high so as not to interfere with the bass. Oh, right? well, she's sliding up a bit. Yeah, yeah, to be fair, Misa was going up the, the fretboard so you can kind of still hear the trebly notes, but she's not going on a, you know, a jazz odyssey up at the highest parts here. And then how do we come out of the solo? Let's check that out. Cool, the final thing there is, this is um, something you always have to decide what you're going to do. You'll notice at the end of the solo she's actually holding the note for a while until the next bar. So you have to decide whether you want to let your note ring into the, the next bar, so that's like when the vocals come in, when the kind of chorus or the pre-chorus starts, or you want to kind of cut it short and go straight to the chord. This is probably a good way of doing it, because he's letting it ring for a bit. Doing a kind of... Oh, I messed that up. Doing a kind of power slide. Pick slide down uh, to give her time to get to the, the next chord. Okay, so she's bent up to the highest D that you can get on the guitar. Is that you were in again? And what she's done here is the kind of Hendrix trick of reaching over and grabbing another string. So she's holding down the B and the E string, and you get that real, real spicy dissonance. Instead of it just being one note, and I reach over, and you can get both of them. Whether this was a accidental or on purpose, I don't know, because you do sometimes accidentally grab strings when you don't mean to, but provided you lean into it, it just sounds cool and intentional here, so as far as I'm concerned, that's that's intentional to get that distance right. Again, if I've got cards left, I will link to a breakdown of how to kind of grab the string, the, the, the Hendrix bend trick with the eye, um, and what she's doing... The bend does go a tiny bit tiny bit sour towards the end and that's that's just what happens live sometimes doesn't really matter <laughs> still sounds good and then she's giving herself a bar of holding that note i'm kind of counting this uh probably in half time but this is how i would count it if i was playing it if i had to do this so i'm just going to explain it in that way so the bar is kind of going on and then the third beat it sounds like she's doing a slide down and getting into the octaves on the fourth beat so I'll count along here right One, two, three, four, right. One, two, slide, octave. Right, I'll try and play along with that and hopefully it'll make a bit more sense when I'm talking. One, two, slide. Okay. So I, I do apologise, I ended up getting far more technical there than I intended to, but um, I, I do sometimes struggle to break these things down without going into too much uh, detail, so any suggestions on that? <laughs> How I can do it without getting too technical would, would be great. But it'd be better if I just play stuff and don't explain exactly what it is, but just say this is this is what's happening. I don't know. That's the analysis video for the rest of the song. That's the band made reaction analysis playlist there. Hit subscribe if you want to keep up to date with the channel. Uh, support me on Patreon if you want to see more of this kind of thing. But take it easy, guys, and have a good one.